Hello, this is Andy from the Engineers Academy, and in today's video tutorial, we're going to be looking at standard international units and metric prefixes. Now, if you've already worked through any of our previous courses or units, then you will already have a working knowledge of standard international units and metric prefixes, but in this tutorial, we're going to spend some time looking at why they're used and the benefits of adopting these systems. So to begin with, standard international units are based on precise, definite standards. And I'll give you an example of what I mean there. So as an example, one kilogram is the mass of one litre of water, and that value will never change, it will be fixed. When we compare that to the old imperial system, a lot of those measurements were based on things such as the human body. So we have the foot as a measure of a length, and that was originally determined by the length of a person's foot. So we can already see that the SI system has the benefit of being much more accurate. Another advantage of the metric system, or the SI system, is that it uses a base of 10 like our number system. And what we mean there is, if we were to go from the number 2 to 3, in one decimal places, we would go 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, all the way up to 2.9, and then 3.0. There's 10 equal sized increments. The same is true if we were to go from 2.1 to 2.2, there would be 10 equally spaced increments. If we compare that to the old imperial system, then a lot of those measures didn't use a base of 10. As an example, there's 12 inches in a foot, and there's 14 ounces in a pound. So the SI system is simplified in that regard. So because we use a base of 10, we can also introduce SI prefixes. So we have kilo, which represents a thousand, and we have mega, which represents a million. So what we can do is we can move in increments of a thousand and we can assign a metric prefix to those values. And we'll spend a bit more time looking at that in a moment. Now, one of the huge advantages of using the SI system is that all of the units are interrelated. So this means that the way that a mass is derived comes from the derivation of a volume and so on. And what this means is that when we do our calculations, if we work in SI units, then we know that our solutions or our calculated values will also be in SI units. And I'll give you another example of this in a moment. And finally, SI units are globally recognised. It makes communication of information much more straightforward. So let's take a look at our SI units and how they're derived. First of all, we have our seven SI base units. And we've already seen some of these when we looked at dimensional analysis. We've already seen mass, length, time and temperature, where the SI units of mass is kilograms, length is metres, time is seconds and temperature is Kelvin. And there's three other base units. We have the ampere, the mole, and the candela. And all other engineering quantities can be derived from these seven base units. We then have SI derived units. And it's useful to recall the basic definitions that we used in dimensional analysis. So we had things like a volume was a length cubed. Velocity was a distance traveled per unit time. And density was mass per unit volume. Now the reason why this is useful for these SI derived units is that we can then use our seven SI base units to determine the units for each of these. So volume, we just said was a length cubed. The SI units of a length is meters, therefore the SI units of volume is meters cubed. And velocity is a distance traveled per unit time. Well a distance is a length, so what we actually have is length per unit time. The SI units of length is meters, the SI units of time is seconds, therefore the SI units of velocity is meters per second. And finally we have density as an example. Density is mass per unit volume. The units of mass is kilograms, the units of volume is meters cubed, therefore the SI units of density must be kilograms per meter cubed. Moving on we have SI derived units with special names, and you will have already seen a lot of these. We have newtons, pascals, joules, watts, volts, coulombs, and there are lots of other different examples of these. If we focus on newtons for a moment, we know that newtons is a measure of force. And the easiest way to think of a force or to find a formula for force is mass times acceleration. Well, if we didn't assign that the units of newtons, mass is kilograms, and acceleration is meters per second squared. So we would have this complicated unit of kilogram meters per second squared. So instead, we call that Newtons, and we attribute that name to Sir Isaac Newton because he did a lot of work in this field. And the same will be true for Pascals, Joules, Watts, and so on. 
And finally, we have SI derived unit combinations. And we've got examples there of Newton meters, where we've taken the special name Newtons and combined it with meters. And that will give us the SI units of torque. We have Newtons per meter, joules per Kelvin, and so on. So for these SI derived units with special names, if you're ever unsure what the SI units are, then I would recommend looking it up. And over time, you'll build your knowledge base of what the SI units are for different engineering quantities. But if you're ever in doubt, just look them up. So let's move on and look briefly at metric prefixes. And we have already seen these when we looked at standard form. The advantage of using metric prefixes is it makes it a lot easier to handle very large and very small numbers. And we've got some examples there. We can work in multiples of a thousand, as I said earlier. So 25,000, we could use a metric prefix to represent that. We've got 2,345,785, again a large number where we could represent that using a metric prefix. And finally we have a small number, 0 0.000045. And commas are used to group those numbers into thousands, or factors of a thousand. Another benefit of using these is that there's calculator functions to support these. So if you look at your calculator, You'll have a button which says ENG, E-N-G, capital letters. And you can also move in factors of a thousand in the opposite direction on your calculator display using SHIFT ENG. And I'll give you some examples now. So if you type 25,000 into your calculator and then you press ENG, your calculator is going to display 25 times 10 to the 3. Well, times 10 to the 3 is represented by the metric prefix KILO. So instead of 25 times 10 to the 3, we have 25 kilo. Next we have 2,345,785. If you type that into your calculator display and press ENG, it's going to return 2.346 times 10 to the 6. Well, times 10 to the 6 is mega. So we have 2.346 mega. And finally, we have 0 0.000045. If we type that into our calculator and press ENG, it will return 45 times 10 to the minus 6, which is 45 micro. Now please note that these aren't the same things as standard form. 25 times 10 to the 3 isn't expressed in standard form. In standard form, that would be 2.5 times 10 to the 4. And the same for 45 times 10 to the minus 6. In standard form, that would be 4.5 times 10 to the minus 5. But we're not expressing these numbers in standard form, we're expressing them in a way that we can apply metric prefixes to them. So we can combine metric prefixes and SI units, and again there's just a couple of examples here. 25,000 newton meters is the same as 25 times 10 to the 3 newton meters, or 25 kilonewton meters. We can do the same with a value in pascals, 2,345,785 pascals is the same as 2.346 times 10 to the 6 pascals, or 2.346 megapascals. And finally, 0 0.000045 coulombs is the same as 45 times 10 to the minus 6 coulombs, or 45 micro coulombs. This table here highlights our most common metric prefixes. When we're dealing with large numbers, we have kilo, which is 10 to the 3, mega 10 to the 6, giga 10 to the 9, and tera 10 to the 12. And when dealing with smaller numbers, we have milli, which is 10 to the minus 3, micro 10 to the minus 6, nano 10 to the minus 9, and pico 10 to the minus 12. I don't expect you to remember these. These are provided on the equation and information sheet for this unit. So to finish, let's look at the reasons why it's always best to work in SI units. And I'm going to give an example, and this first example is using the correct method. So we have a question which states, what is the stress acting on a wire of diameter 8mm when placed under tension by a 12 kN force? Now as always, the first thing we should do is extract the information from the question. So on the left hand side, I've said that I have a diameter of 8mm. I know I'm going to be calculating an area of a circular section so I'm going to convert that to a radius of 4mm by halving it. The next thing I've done is convert 4mm into metres, and I've done that by dividing by 1000. So what I have is my radius in SI units. I've also taken my 12 kN force from the question, and I've converted that to 12,000 newtons again using SI units. 
In the bottom left, I've calculated the area. And when I've calculated the area, I've done pi times the radius squared, but I've used the radius in SI units. And that gives me an area of 5.03 times 10 to the minus 5 meters squared. I know that the units of that are meters squared because I'm working in SI units of meters. So over onto the right hand side, I've calculated the stress doing force divided by area. I've taken the force in SI units. I've taken the area in SI units. Therefore, my solution of 238,732,415 must be in SI units of Pascals. So just to reinforce here, if I work in SI units, it gives me an answer in SI units. And the last step I've done there is to convert the 238 million to 238.7 megapascals, where I've converted 10 to the 6 to mega. So let's look at exactly the same example, except this time we're going to use an incorrect method. The question's the same. What is the stress acting on a wire of diameter 8 millimetres when placed under a tension by a 12 kilonewton force? And I've started well. I've extracted the information from the question. Diameter 8 millimetres, radius 4 millimetres, force 12 kilonewtons. But here's my first mistake. I haven't converted that information to SI units. Instead, I've jumped straight to calculating the area. The area is pi r squared. But you notice what I've done here is I've used a radius in millimetres rather than in metres. OK, so that's not a huge problem. All it means is my area of 50.3 is in millimetre squared rather than metre squared. And you may be able to convert millimetre squared to metre squared at this stage, but it's not as simple as dividing by a thousand. This is an area conversion now rather than a linear conversion, so it's a little bit more complicated. Now here's where my mistake is compounded because on the right hand side I calculate the stress doing force divided by area. I've used my force in kilonewtons and I've used my area in millimetres squared and I've yielded an answer of 0.238. But what are the units of that? Now I understand that if I've used a force in kilonewtons and an area in millimetres squared that the units are kilonewtons per millimetre squared but that's somewhat meaningless. There would never be a reason to work in kilonewtons per millimeter squared. So what I would need to do is convert it to pascals or megapascals. And again, that conversion can be done, but it's a lot more complicated than if I'd just worked in SI units in the first place. I would need to convert the kilonewtons to newtons and the millimeter squared to meter squared and factor all of that in in order to calculate the stress in pascals. So I hope you found this video useful. First of all, looking at the reasons why we use standard international units and metric prefixes and second, looking at the reasons why it's so important to work in SI units when we do our calculations.